there are currently also talks about integrating people's aadhaar data with drone camera so that it becomes easy for the police and the state governments to identify and track people and that of course opens a, a different pandora's box altogether uh, the covid 19 lockdown has seen a number of police forces including telangana police kerala police delhi police deploying drones to keep an eye out on potential lockdown violations they are also being used to spray disinfectants which as far as uh, my understanding goes are not currently allowed under the regulations on the other hand drones also present an opportunity especially in the backdrop of the uh, lockdown in helping with fulfilling essential services especially e-commerce delivery and, but although that hasn't really happened yet it appears as if we've been left to deal with the dire consequences of drone usage rather than reap some of the benefits that they present what we are largely witnessing is that the uses of drones at the hands of the police which raises questions around state surveillance and also triggers the proportionality argument in today's discussion we'll take a look at the regulatory framework that allows for drone uses in india and if that particular framework has been effective so far drones can also be potential enablers like we've discussed for certain things especially during a global crisis like the one in which we find ourselves right now we'll address why that bit hasn't happened though we'll also try and answer questions around accountability and transparency especially with respect to police usage of drones we can then open it up to the audience who can ask their questions via the q and a option at the bottom of their screens uh, for the discussion i am joined by uh, kishore janalagada co-founder of drone aerospace systems which is involved in manufacturing drones and shashank shrinivasan director at technology of wildlife whose work involves around using drones for wildlife conservation and using them in the wild for location intelligence uh so kishore let me come to you first uh, do you think that the current digital sky policy which governs the uses of drones is working at all uh because when the policy was being formulated the dgca consulted drone manufacturers uh, do you think that your comments uh, found a reflection in the policy that came out in august 2018 and was subsequently implemented in december the same year uh, also from what i have been seeing while reporting is that a lot of uh, police stations especially use drones manufactured by dji are those drones even allowed to fly in india right now so in my best understanding for your last question no the answer is no uh, they are not allowed uh, as per the dgca regulation that mm. exists right now and uh, but there is a catch in that uh, coming back to your first question because of the reason that the although the rules and regulations have come out in uh, december 2018 as you said they are not yet implementable so they are not yet implementable because the back end systems that are required that the authentication server that is necessary is still not functional so as of now whoever are doing npnt clearance and everything even the manufacturers are doing it as a provisional thing by saying that we are following all your guidelines and we will be able to comply when you get the regulation effective so it is not it is for future not for current and they are allowed to fly based on that and even in that category dji does not qualify so therefore no it's a violation of the regulation as of now what the what the police are doing so and uh, and as far as taking feedback from the customers they had dgca did open out for a public uh, you know interest of i mean uh, information they asked sent out queries people put out uh, you know suggestions of what needs to be done some suggestions were taken some suggestions were not taken especially with regard to uh, uh, certain things like uh, they had this thing about uh, specifically identifying critical areas zones which are not safe to uh, allow people to fly but typical usage would be that they will publish a negative list and we will not be able to uh, fly in those areas but no they didn't want that they didn't want to publish a negative list so what they expected us to do is that you tell where you want to fly and we will just tell you whether you can fly or not fly at that time you know so it was like they didn't want to publish an open negative list so that was like one thing which was not taken but i think that is an easier way to operate uh, so that's just one uh, example of it okay kishore uh, th- that's a really interesting statement that's happening there that the regulations are somehow for a future scenario and not for a current scenario but the dgca has kind of made it mandatory post december 1st 2018 technically they are active but so which makes all almost all drone flying illegal in the country as, as if the drone regulations do not exist or they do not favor any drone flying yeah so that's like an hanging sword on your head because you cannot comply uh, to the regulation because it is still not in full effect 
and at the same time they can catch you for not complying you know it's they, they can and you still have to comply as per at least the getting the certification process and the uh, you know uh, the uh, clearances done so it is going to be a complicated and i think it's kind of like a risk on the people who are uh, actually flying right now in in terms of uh, what a manufacturers can hope for or is hoping for are our manufacturers drone manufacturers facing issues because they're not sure how to manufacture these drones or is there some understanding from the drone manufacturers that okay we can make certain categories of drones for example say the nano drones at least uh, right. who are unregulated which are unregulated so there are manufacturers but the nano drones only uh, you know cater to the mostly the toy market so there are people who are interested in the toy market and there is, some of them are actually even doing it those, those are the nano drones which are sub 250 grams and cannot fly i think 50 meters beyond uh, 15 feet beyond us uh, so it's just a really a toy uh, tool but when it comes to manufacturers for the industry so currently the npnt not being already available to actual for actual use the way it is operating is that the people who people have created their own npnt servers as test platforms you know so they have like a test server where they have uh, built on the specifications pro published by the dgca but it is not the uh, official one so people are trying to build an npnt compliant drone based on these test servers and that is being provided as proof to dgca which is all documentary proof right now and that is basically given based on that you are given a provisional certificate it's a provisional it's not a final certificate also so the provisional certificate allows you to op- more than um, allows you to operate and uh, actually it doesn't allow you to operate it allows you to make a sale to the government so if there is a government tender that is there the government tender needs to have says clear very clearly that you need to have an npnt certified drone and these drones which are given the provisional certification complied to those requirements so therefore you are at least able to make a sale to the government to our government bodies but yet the operational part of it because you don't have an actual npnt is still dependent upon local law enforcing authority so it's 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 really interesting that uh, this is all only to ensure that few companies can get government tenders but at the same time uh, you're seeing that uh, companies like dji have clearly made issued statements that they are not going to manufacture for indian standards mm-hmm. which which is what dgca is bringing out uh, so are there issues of say these drones being exported out of india i don't think manufacturers can scale out that right this is a very specifically then designed for india use only no to actually there are some manufacturers who as i best understand are actually exporting it to uh, lesser countries uh, like papua new guinea and sometimes even indonesia philippines and all of them so yes mostly the uh, southeast asian countries there are p- people exporting it to these countries as well and where npnt and others don't play a role and i think uh, a lot of the people are looking at that as a f- favorable market also there is one last question that i want to ask you which is on what's the authority of uh, that for dgca to regulate drones in india we you know it's the director general of civil aviation that's what dgc yes. is and it's only relevant for civil aviation and clearly uh, airplanes are defined when they fly beyond a certain height and that's why i guess your classification of drones and the height limits kick in but at the same time i think the current rules are only for drones which are in line of sight that you can only regulate it fly a drone if it's in line of sight and you cannot bring out drones which are out of line of sight say control with radio control with some video form of it uh, but the dgca is allowing testing for manufacturers to build them can you explain that's, a bit more about this that's right so uh, 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 to to the later part there is uh, there was an expression of interest that was opened about sometime last year for, for what is known now as bvlos that is beyond visual line of sight 
so this is only in test in for only for testing so you should you need to qualify with a certain set of categories uh, criteria as well which includes that you need to have an actual licensed pilot that i'm telling about a civil aviation pilot not a uh, drone pilot so you need a person with a ppl also as part of that uh, you know team which you for you to apply for a permit to do this bvlos testing and you have to give a particular area which is at least 15 kilometers uh, 15 kilometer radius for which you need to speak to either a private uh, land ownership or a government body which gives you the permission to use the particular space for this particular testing and as a consortium you can apply for this bvlos uh, license and then uh, you are given a permit to fly this uh, test test platforms which only in this test plat test areas are you allowed to actually do beyond visual uh, line of sight elsewhere it re- as you said you have to fly within the uh, uh, you know within the visual line of sight which is defined as i think 400 meters uh, as as i recall it is 400 meters is defined as the line of sight so you cannot actually fly beyond uh, 400 meters except in these uh, test areas and in these test areas those who have applied i think uh, right now there are about uh, four people who have already been permitted i have, i have to update myself with the numbers so uh, i think there are four people who have been permitted as of now and uh, there are more who are going to get permission we ourselves also have uh, been uh, we are being evaluated for the same permission in uh, uh, south india so like this kind of things are also happening in the background where you are expected to fly for a minimum of 100 hours with uh, uh, one among the dgca authorities uh, you know in their presence or how that is going to happen we'll only know when we actually begin it because as of now the still the uh, you know uh, uh, the evaluation is going on where they are giving permit to people and this has already been uh, i think a year and a half now almost i think last uh, january february this started and it's already now march so it's over a year since this process has begun and uh, regarding the first part uh, whether the dgca is the authority is i don't know from a legal perspective that is who gave them the authority however world over even if you look at uh, uh, say the us as an example the drone rules drone regulations are drone rules and the authority enforcing authority is being uh, handled by fa so which is also their civil aviation authority so therefore uh, across the world you can see that the civil aviation authority is the one being give, given charge of doing this how has dgca got involved in our country is not sure to me from a legal standpoint however uh, my best understanding that is that the uh, ministry of home affairs is what has um, asked them to actually frame the put the framework and everything and make sure that they govern the entire uh, process so i as of now i think they have initially they were not keen on taking up the responsibility but i'm seeing more and more that now they seem to be more interested in drones i think they are more interested in the uh, passenger drones that might eventually come up okay uh, so we're going to move to sashank i'm going to come back to you I'm, i i want to try to understand the pilot side of it now that you mentioned passenger drones and how do you pilot drones okay. sashank you've been working training you've been a drone pilot you've been using them uh, in wildlife conservation for a really long time now before i think even the regulations have come into force can you tell us what was the scenario before the drone regulations came and and what's the status right now like were there was there more confusion back then is it more clear now uh how is a drone pilot regulated how how was your experience being one or even getting more people trained as such okay great thanks for that sinivas uh, oh and welcome back samya sinivas has asked me a couple of questions about like my experience i'm just going to go over that uh, so okay. essentially i'll just give you a give a brief timeline timeline of the regulation uh, the regulatory history in india regarding drones right uh, so in 2014 sometime in uh, if i remember that around october 10th or so the DGCA issued a notification which uh, essentially banned all drone flying yes. in the country all right yes uh, yes of course now before 2014 there were some again there be people who have been flying remote uh, remote aircraft like aero modeling since right. maybe the early 90s maybe the early 80s if i'm not mistaken right uh, again i grew up in calcutta and i was part of an aero modeling club when i was in middle school so that would be around uh, the mid 90s and there were people flying 
aircraft of the Calcutta Maidan. So there's a small runway over there, which is doubled as a cricket pitch as well. And people would fly a model aircraft of that runway. And this is again the mid 90s. So sometime around 2010 or 2011, like the drone industry worldwide started picking up. Uh, again, part of this was uh, if, uh, people started modifying Arduino devices to actually create like stable uh, quadcopter platforms. Uh, and that kind of spiraled off into small independent hobbyists and then small businesses around this as well. Uh, so around 2010, 2011, drones started like making the presence felt. Uh, DJI started uh, manufacturing the Phantom One, selling it in a big way. Uh, 2014, again in October, uh, there were some incidents in India of drone use. I think, if I remember correctly, the main instigator for the drone ban was a pizza delivery service based out of Bombay, uh, which uh, they had a PR stunt where they delivered a pizza using a drone, and essentially that brought the entire house collapsing down on itself. Uh, so the uh, metaphorically, not not literally. Uh, so essentially, what that resulted in the DGCA ban. So between 2014 and 2019, all drone flying uh, for civilian purposes in India was uh, technically illegal. Now I say technically because. Regular, from a regulatory perspective, the enforcing authority is unclear, the implementing authority is unclear, who has authority to actually give permission to fly drones is, was unclear and is still in practice on the ground, uh, you know, very, very vague. Uh, so between 2014 and 2019, there were still drones in the country, there was still a drone industry, uh, there was uh, companies like ASTV Aerospace, like Quidditch, uh, started um, working specifically in like their niches. So, for example, Quidditch, uh, a company we've collaborated with in the past, has been doing some excellent work around the IPL photography. Yeah, they've uh, also had to, they've also done many other projects, and they again at this point of time focus on working in uh, the film the film world and entertainment itself. Right? Uh, companies like them, other companies got the permissions they needed to actually operate uh, very publicly and at high profile events. Uh, but again, under the DGC regulations, it's all technically illegal because the ban was very tersely worded and did not leave any room for exceptions or exemptions of any kind. So in practice, what that meant is, again, we've also uh, been flying drones over 2017, 2018. And in practice, what this has meant is that we're just working with government departments and we're working with authority to actually operate our devices with like... Uh, permission letters from people like the district collector, people like the chief secretary of a state, uh, uh, joint secretaries in the in the government of India headquarters in uh, in Delhi, right? So different departments and these secretaries who are again IS officers who have extreme amounts of like administrative power uh, issue these letters and after that the entire state mechan um, uh, machinery just complies and uh, make sure that the work they want gets done, right? Uh, one project I was talking to Swami about earlier was in 2017. So one of the first projects we conducted as a company, as a technology for wildlife, uh, was on behalf of the Uttar Pradesh Forest Department. They had a, this was again, uh, during, during Akhilesh Yadav's tenure as Chief Minister. So this is like 2017, uh, February. And essentially, they had a man-eating tiger on the loose in Pilibit district of, uh, Uttar, of West, in Western Uttar Pradesh. And the villagers had protested saying they won't go to vote in the upcoming elections until the tiger was captured and taken care of. Uh, so for this, we were called in to actually help the forest department uh, to use drones and actually uh, help locate the tiger. So this is the collaboration we did at that time with the Quidditch, who uh, had drone operators and uh, drones available on standby. And the letter of permission we got was that from the chief minister's office because he essentially said, okay, we need drones among other uh, devices and um, other technology, other techniques to actually find this tiger. And uh, that was the issuing authority. And uh, again, we were actually conducting these flights, which under DGCA law were technically illegal, with like police officers controlling the drone itself. They were looking at the live video feed. So again, like the question of what, where the illegality comes into place is, is unclear because uh, Again, India has a federation, it's got state systems. So, you know, on, in practice on the ground, it can, it can all be very, very great. Uh, and projects like that have continued over the past few years. People have been doing work for mining companies, for infrastructure of various kinds, for electricity departments. And uh, the permission letters come. They're on official letterheads in the government of India. These are government representatives and officials issuing these letters of permission. Uh, and none of this has been contested in a court of law, the DGCA cannot not be aware of these operations because they're very public. Like Quidditch flies drones above every stadium. They get permission from the Ministry of Home Affairs, the Ministry of Defense, such do the operations. Uh, do these violate the DGCA ban as well? I don't, I don't know. 
Ashrang, I would like just to. to I, I have. To I have. Sure, sure, please, sure, please go ahead. Just to clarify, I mean, because you said uh, in the 2014 letter that bans the drone flying, it very clearly says that it's all, for all civilian use except for by government bodies. So therefore, if you get a letter from um, government bodies, it is considered legal. So that was the reason. So you can only do a government job; you cannot do a private job. You know that's how it so, was. So right? because also, uh, since I've been reporting on drone users, especially by the police and state governments in particular, so what I have uh, essentially found out while reporting is that there almost is never even a written order that the police can produce. So if you go and ask them who authorized your drone flight. who was the authority behind this there are almost never written orders which just gives you a feeling that there is sort of no accountability and especially no transparency around uh, the entire process also because the police hires a lot of drones and sometimes you don't even know the people that they are hiring things from so all of that this adds to this you know sort of complex infrastructure that is around there and it results in something you don't even know what's exactly going on there if the police was even authorized to fly drones and that is only you know the operational part of it the drones that are flying in the air is of course capturing footage so that fo- footage is somewhere of course stored processed what exactly happens to that particular footage if there are any sort of security safeguards around it we don't know anything about the processes at all and all of that happens begins because of the fact that there is almost never a written order and you don't always know where to go and actually talk to and who to talk to so how do you think uh, that happens so i'll just continue with that uh, yeah. so that um, essentially the this government bodies component is fascinating right because does that mean that the again because this is the problem with like a with, with tersely worded orders is it is it okay for private or parties or private operators to own devices and try them on behalf of the government does the government need to be the one who owning and controlling the devices is it okay for the private operators to be hired and to do some of some operations for the government and other operations privately because again in the past 5 years no operator has been able to sustain itself only on government contracts because the lack of permissions has resulted in less investment into the sector so people are actually relying on projects to bootstrap themselves all the way through um and this really this really confuses matters right uh, there have been cases projects have heard of where people have gone in again like you said there's no written orders at all uh, when they are when they when, when the operators ask for written orders the government tells them you're doing it for us no one's going to question you and then they're sent into the field with government officers uh there are risks to this because again it's not like the government is a monolith different departments uh, can contest each other's actions if the you know for example the department of uh, the forest department wants to fly drones and the department of mining contest that do the hoop do that one of them call in the police to actually enforce the no fly zone so is 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 that the way it actually works in practice uh and it's it's all it's all it's all very risky especially on the ground like there have been cases where there have been misunderstandings there have been no written orders so till someone can actually make this couple of phone calls they require to get through to the senior officer who authorize the action itself they you know in like the, not arrested necessarily but they are definitely being held against their will till they can show that what they were doing was legitimate whatever that means I would also like you to respond to that, but just be, be, before you do, I would also like you to address the point of who in this situation. For instance, if a police has hired a particular drone operator, and because we don't have a written order, we don't even know who exactly the drone operator is or which company that person is associated to. Who in this particular case carries the liability? For instance, the the data that is collected via the drones, if that particular data is used in a way that it was initially not intended uh, uh, for it to be. so who in that case actually takes the burden and the liability if something actually goes wrong please also incorporate that particular bit uh, in your uh, answer sure so the the question of who owns the data itself is in a sense that it fall under i think it falls under copyright law from my understanding in that if someone is flying the drone or in the drone then they the sd card or whatever memory storage device they have uh, on the drone itself they own that they own that and therefore they own all the footage on the device as well right uh, in practice what happens is that the police ask for the sd card directly uh, again in most cases where you're working with uh, police departments who are tech, tech savvy and aware of what uh, they're doing then they essentially have the drone operator fly the drone uh, the live live stream of the uh, from the drone if that's what's being collected is streamed to them itself uh, because they're operating it like uh, while with the drone operator uh, next to them 
and the they take the SD card from the drone operator, transfer the footage over to their computers, wipe the SD card, and then hand it back to the drone operator. Right? Uh, in which case, at that point of time, the footage is now the property of the police. The police control it. Uh, I don't think copyright law really applies over here uh, because again, the police have the footage, and there might not be a written order which actually shows that the drone operator did the operation. So again, there might not be a paper trail at all, uh, but. The fact remains, again, from my perspective, that the drone operators are the ones who've flown the drone and actually collected the footage. So it's also their responsibility to ensure it's not misused in any way. Um, in practice, again, for the most part, what happens is the police control the footage. There have been cases where they've just had the drone operator to take the footage and make a map for them or something later. And then the drone operator also has a copy of the footage, which is where it can become more risky, where a private party has got uh, data belonging to the public of the public, which they can use for their own, uh, you know, for anything they want to do. So it, it might be I didn't, like mapping out uh, grocery stores, might be mapping out how people are moving around. Uh, it might be for future facial recognition analysis. Again, yeah. it's, it's with them and uh, the data privacy bill doesn't really cover uh, situations like this. Uh, Kishore, uh, uh, you want to add something to that? Yes, uh, I mean um, about the uh, I mean experience with regard to especially with regard to Andhra, and you were telling about how a private operator can uh, do a job for a government body. How is, I mean, how does it work? In fact, this was a I think in my best understanding the problem that was trying to be addressed by Andhra because uh, you cannot even if you're contracted by the government, you're still a private body doing the job. So how do you handle this situation? Is they came up with something called as a wet lease agreement, you know, the, which is a typical wet lease agreement which happens for aircraft, where your aircraft and the staff are basically handed over to another company, which is in this case a government thing. So you're as good as working for them, you know, under their banner and everything, you know. So that is how they actually uh, worked around this whole uh, process of at least the legal part, you know, the paperwork was a wet lease agreement. So that is how they got the job done with uh, in Andhra state. Uh, when they claim to have a DGCA clearance for the entire state of Andhra Pradesh for this thing, but we never got to see the copy of the clearance, so I don't really know how much it was a copy. So that part I'm not really sure about. Then the second part of it, where you told, where he talked about the SD cards and the data being transferred and how that has happened, that's uh, quite a difficult thing because I can tell you that almost more than half the works that were done were not on paper. So they were not like, uh, you know, there was no document to say the permission is granted or anything like that. It was all phone calls or in person, you know, all those kind of things. And sometimes they would be in your presence while you are flying, but other times they would not. They'll just say, go ahead and then do it. So it was it was a very, very informal way of doing it. So I don't know accountability, how it's going to work in, this, in the context in that thing. About transfer of data, in, in our, when we did all the survey for, um, uh, Amravati, the capital of new capital of Andhra, all the data was asked by us in in voice again and again in, uh, on a phone call to be handed over to a particular person who would come and take a hard disk of data from us. And only later did we get to know that whom we were handing out the data to is not a government representative, but another private party who is uh, uh, doing some other analytics and everything. Now. A consequential issue of this whole thing came up when it came to payment because we had to you know, sh uh, showcase that we have done the job and we have got all the data over there. Then, came, then comes the thing saying that, okay, when you handed over the data, we have taken a signature of the person who is handing over the data and everything. But it come, when it comes to rules, you need to have it stamped by the department official, signed by a particular authorized signatory, all these kind of things which were not done at the time of the data collection. So that became uh, an issue also. So, yeah, so I don't think anything on the, when actually implementation, nothing happens. And just to, uh, to add to that, that makes, uh, that's really, that, that's fascinating on the ground because uh, what that means is that there is, there's almost no record of any of these activities, right? Like there's the initial the footage, but there's no record of the government issuing a contract of the, of a tender being issued of, modes of payment, uh, it's all its all very unclear, which uh, is, is quite difficult to understand in the context of if, if in case someone had to sue for damages for anything which has happened as a result of either the actual flight or the data collected, how do they go about it? Where's the paper, where's the evidence, where's the proof to actually take this to a court of law if that's the route someone wants to take? Uh, so again, like a underpinning uh, sub 
context of the work we are currently working on is like where where what is where is recourse uh, like if you need if you if something goes wrong who do you appeal to if the police have used drones and have harmed you in some way you can't go to the police and complain about it because uh, what they're doing is technically illegal under the dvcs i so what what recourse do you have to actually uh, obtain justice in this context very interesting because uh, recently i read a story about how the kerala police had hired private drone operators so when i talked to one of the igps in the north zone i think he was in charge of the kasaragod district so he told me um, uh, that they just have these drone operators and so the footage is essentially stored on the mobile phones of the police officials and when i asked him how do you ensure that the drone operators are actually deleted the data from his side they, he just said that we just ensure it i mean there was nothing concrete to go with i'm not even sure if they actually make sure that the data is essentially deleted from a drone operators uh, devices uh, so uh, anyway uh, i think of course drones uh, sort of present this uh, dystopic a uh, view of the future if you start looking at it that way but of course there it also essentially can act as a potential enabler especially in times of a global crisis for instance the times we are in right now uh, especially for instance drones can potentially help us in uh, delivering a lot of essential services fulfilling e-commerce deliveries uh, do you think post lockdown uh, we might see a push towards that happening sort of drones being more and more are uh, utilized in e-commerce deliveries to fulfill more essential services and do you see the regulations around drone usage uh, subsequently and consequently being relaxed uh, for that particular um, issue uh, is this to me uh, it's it's to it's to both of you it's to both okay. of you yeah so my uh, uh, my personal view is that uh, when it comes to e-commerce delivery that is uh, uh, things like amazon flipkart i don't see it happening with drones not now I, i don't see it even in the much in much in the future as well i think of those as more like uh, technology demonstrators to actually learn and understand the technology and further the technology for better causes because i think there are far too many safety hazards with uh, drones delivery in uh, in uh, crowded urban areas however i do see the delivery of uh, essential equipment like for example well now if you want ppe to if i am a manufacturer of uh, ppe equipment for doctors and everything there is no way for me to transport it and in the current lockdown situation you know it is very diff- difficult time so i think like this kind of intercity or interzonal transportation i see a good future for that so you will have like uh, uh, like how you have hubs like airport as a i mean as a hub now you will have smaller hubs where you will have these drone uh, carrying essential equipment and uh, delivery of those things so i think that there is an advantage but i will still see that only from an emergency operations and critical missions not from daily supplies because i think it's far too expensive for daily supplies shashank you want to uh, weigh yeah. in yeah sure so just to like clarify i think that some of the uses for drones during the current lockdown and pandemic are uh, you know i could i could break them down there are uses which are which are extremely useful but there are also uh, ones which are completely gimmicky and there are ones which are useful but dangerous right uh, so for example i do think surveillance is definitely useful as a as a drone use uh, but it is very dangerous to consider in the given context when it's being used by the state to enforce uh, the lockdown quarantine it's been used again after the delhi riots it's been it was used to uh, surveil protests as well so question of whether the people who are protesting whether the civil rights are being violated uh, is still not has not been answered clearly even now during the current lockdown where people have been allowed to leave the houses have been allowed to actually go to grocery stores they have been allowed to move out so it's not a curfew it's a lockdown right uh, but the but drones and the police force are still uh, treating it like a curfew so they kind of send people back home so it's one thing to make sure people don't gather in groups it's another to use drones to chase people down roads to try and get images of the faces so that they can then be uh, prosecuted or arrested uh, at a further point of time even though they haven't violated any law they've only violated uh, a, a lockdown in a sense and again it's, it's again all very very unclear uh, so i do think surveillance is a useful use of drones but also dangerous however using drones for spraying antibiotics during a pandemic caused by a virus is nonsensical uh, using loudspeakers on drones for crowd control is also nonsensical because there's no reason you can't mount those loudspeakers on 
trucks or other ground vehicles. So there are lots of gimmicks being sold to police departments now. And again, there is an attractiveness to it as well in that uh, drones are a very easy way to, in a sense, uh, project power, right? Because they're highly visible. They, are, uh, they can be uh, quite noisy depending on the type of drone you're using. Uh, they can actually be used to uh, project a sense of control where there might not actually be that much control on the ground. Whether drone flies over, anyone that goes to police is watching, but actually there's some private operator flying the drone while playing PUBG on the side, you know, so there's no real overlap as to, again, so that the drone is up in the air and that's what, that's what's being used to show uh, power. So going forward, like after the lockdown, uh, hopefully there'll be the valuable use of the drones are the ones which are going to be promulgated in a sense. And uh, the ones which are dangerous are going to be weeded out or at least there's going to be proper, uh, you know, uh, safeguards kept implemented so that they're not as dangerous as they currently are. Uh, I think from the discussions so far, what you've basically understood is that drones have exceptionally uh, have been exceptional uh, when it comes to state surveillance, when it comes to carrying out state surveillance. But perhaps uh, for the better part, for the, for the thing that they can be used in better ways, uh, perhaps there still is a long way to go from what uh, we've understood so far. Uh, so I think with this, it's okay to open the discussion up for the audience. Uh, uh, I, I would again reiterate uh, that the audience can ask questions using the Q and A uh, section at the bottom of their screens. Uh, we've, we already have uh, one question from Shashidhar uh, KJ, who asks if it is possible to standardize drone manufacturing uh, similar to the automobile industry, and if it is, how would it exactly look like for the drone industry? And uh, I think Kishore, you would uh, like to answer that. Yeah. I definitely think it can be standardized. After all, uh, uh, even the automobile industry, I, in fact, I like to look at the drone industry as uh, in parallel to the uh, how the automobile industry started up. Everything, including the licensing for the pilots, everything should follow the same model as the automobile industry is my personal opinion. Certain standards have to be set up and it can be done. Uh, like for example, what should be the kind of communication as an example so that for certain things, like if you want state control to take over uh, rogue drones, that should be just like setting up a, uh, including an ATC you know, kind of a thing if you have. There can be this thing in terms of ethical and non-ethical. Yeah, those are always debatable and I don't know who will be the right person to comment on those part of it. But definitely it is possible to standardize and I think it is a good time to even work on those standardized uh, you know, me mechanism, both in terms of uh, where the drones can be flied, how the, what is the kind of safety regulations, uh, safety precautions that you have to take, including simple things like you have for automobiles that indicator should always be there. If the light is not working, you can be penalized for, you know, all these kind of things can be put up and they, I think they really need to be put up. In fact, one of the reasons why I think we are also struggling is because we never had this kind of uh, uh, dedicated thing in, from the early days, which is the aero modeling days. This is, I mean, drones are like an evolution of the aero modeling days. And even during aero modeling, they were, if you look at much of the Western countries in US and everything, you had dedicated zones where you can do aero modeling, flying, you know, all of those things are, and you have to follow certain rules. You can't step on to beyond a barricade. You cannot go into the field, the, inside that field, only flying, only the pilot can get into, there are, there are no support person. These kind of rules were there and people were used to follow them, but here they were not. People would just fly anywhere that they found the space to fly, sometimes over their uh, you know, house also. Or uh, so random uh, dried up lake in Hebal used to be, uh, not Hebal, Oskopete used to be our favorite to go and fly uh, drones. So I think uh, starting from there, we have uh, we missed the gun and I think uh, now we still have to start and catch up. And actually it, it is possible to form the, uh, um, you know, standardization, and I think we should focus on that. Shashank, do you have a take on it? No, no not on this particular. I'm not okay. on this question. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, I think uh, uh, when we talk of drones, uh, so I, and pardon me for being for bringing this up again and again because this is essentially what my sort of life's work has been um, for for essentially the good part of the last six months. Uh, the potential of you know misusing a a drone to begin with, just the bad things associated with it that uh, that can be made possible. Second thing is when that particular technology is given to a state department or a police station or a you know even with different police stations with, with different police station jurisdictions, you see a different kind of behavior in terms of how people approach these things. So a so b 
uh, things with that particular police station with that particular police jurisdiction and see ex- essentially generally how things have been have uh, really played out so far um, in which the police has been a completely lackadaisical in maintaining written orders it seems as if the dgca has been completely left out of the equation when it was supposed to be the enforcing and the regulatory authority uh, for drones how the dgc has practically been silent for the good part of the last two years ever since the policy came into force uh, uh, so how exactly do you think that this entire ecosystem could potentially be made better so that we can actually sort of take out the better part of the drones and leave aside the things that we don't really want uh, them to be doing in the society uh, so how do you see this entire infrastructure of a drones flying in the air and not actually uh, sort of hampering your civil rights how exactly are we going to um, approach approach there It's, it's, uh, to, it's, to, it's to both of you. Yeah. Good. So I, I, I go first, Kishore. That's okay. Sure. Sure. Yeah, 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 please do. So essentially, yeah, yeah, that's a fine. really, that's a really large question, right? As to what does like a healthy drone ecosystem in the country look like? Uh, some would argue that what's currently at play is healthy, where the state gets to use drones to do whatever they want with them, and everyone else has to apply for permission. And if the state thinks the permission is good enough, then you go with it, right? And that's, uh, uh, I don't, I, I don't think personally it's very healthy, right? Because there are again uses of drones which are outside of state control which might in a sense be um very healthy for the for civil society uh, which is use, again using drones to regulate state actions using drones to map out to map out areas which are uh, contested by for example mining companies who the state is supporting right so these are all uses like again like the idea of being able to submit drone footage to uh, to a court when contesting something which the state wants right is important again the reason for democracy the reason to have these uh, the pillars of like executive legislative and judicial is so that there is a healthy balance between all three at this point of time if drones can only be used by the state against civil society and not by civil society to protect its own interests then that goes against the interests of the other of the country as a whole right because again then you start becoming authoritarian as opposed to being a liberal democracy uh, so just give that as a upfront uh, thing of my personal uh, sense on this i do think that uh, it is possible to deregulate to uh, to to deregulate drone use uh, to some extent uh, to also decentralize drone control right now again all of it is with the dgc sitting out of delhi uh, what's been happening in the past uh, few weeks because of the uh, pandemic again not the lockdown but the pandemic itself is that states are having to bypass the dgc to actually do what they want because they are finding use for drones in some way or the other now again like i was saying earlier some of these might be gimmicky uses but it is still things the states want to use drones for sorry shashank i'll interject yeah. you there even before the to be honest, to be honest because i i i reported this particular issue even before the pandemic began and we saw you know with the uh, with the protests around cwa rising mm-hmm. erupting essentially around the country and followed that uh, with the Delhi elections uh, so we did file uh, a bunch of rtis about drone uses in right. those in those, these very particular yeah. instances and that is when we came to know that that was essentially my lead into knowing that the police essentially doesn't own a lot a lot, lot of drones that it flies and also mm-hmm. the fact that it doesn't even fly those drones themselves so you know the liability and the responsibility is basically shifted to someone else so even before the pandemic actually hit us we've been seeing uh, where we've been seeing instances where the dgc has been completely sidelined there've been no yeah. orders there have been no clearances taken officers which have which have been reported on to as in using uh, drones flying in the air they don't have a written order and even so they just don't have an order uh, and even if they do they don't have the data maintained centrally somewhere right so that's, that's, that's essentially fascinating right? even because before the pandemic yeah that's fascinating right because the idea is that again the dgc is purpose in what the minister of civil aviation i think the junior minister of aviation as well as uh, other government officials have said is that they want the drone industry to take off to actually be a large contributor to india's like gdp in the com- in the years to come because it's an industry which is growing right but the rules that they currently are ensure that only operators who work for the state or play by the st- or who are uh, in favor of the state are allowed to actually operate and do what they want to so for me personally i would like to see a lot more ngos using drone right now almost no ngos i know of in india use drones there have been amazing uses of drones and of uh, aerial imagery or satellite imagery by ngos uh, across the world uh, for example in bangladesh after the uh, the protests the riots the genocide in uh, myanmar all the rohingya camps in uh, bangladesh there was lots of drone mapping done to actually make conditions for them on the ground better there were the numerous example like this worldwide of civil society using drones for good 
in india right now i would say that's impossible for civil society to do because the regulations mean that uh, if a ngo who again is regulated by the fcra decides to try and try to use drones they have to follow every single rule in the book even if the rules contradict each other while if a police department or any other government departments want to do same they can just go and do it and they, they, they don't have any consequences to suffer going forward right that that is to change to actually make it a healthy drone ecosystem in the country kishore yeah so i i i i have very little to say on this but yes i can understand that uh, you can see the news reports recently also the states are in open defiance of uh, dgca regulations when they are actually saying that simply we cannot follow it uh, the r- r- rules of dgca in, in this conditions because that's too slow we need immediate response we need you know quick response all of that so there is no way that we can actually follow the rules in letter in spirit i don't know but in letter we just simply cannot do it you know so that's how it is uh, right now and i and i see why I, in fact i think that the regulation should have taken care of emergency needs you know which it doesn't the emergency needs are a uh, essential part in this was the part where i in fact i had put down during the regulation framework also trying to say that there are certain aspects we have to cater to during emergency services you know we may not be exactly able to follow these or there might be other reasons where you can't follow these kind of rules also so where is the how much it, there's always this trade off between freedom and misuse so how it is where is the line to be drawn and how it is to be drawn is is very very blurry okay kishore uh, we have a follow up uh, on shashidhar's initial question about uh, standardization of drone manufacturing so uh, shashidhar's follow up is uh, so when you say that we can standardize communication protocols do you think that we should dedicate a band of spectrum for do- for drone communication and if that's possible what are the possible implications for net neutrality in that particular instance so uh, i'm not very familiar with the net neutrality uh, you know arguments around it so i won't be able to say on that but i don't think there's a necessity to actually do a separate bandwidth for this because with the way things are moving we can continue to use the existing protocols and technology which is already in the market for this which can include things like even your 4g and 5g networks for communication it could include your wifi and it can include your uh, uh, other uh, frequencies which is in the 2.4 ism band itself to do this so it, there is no real requirement for you to go with a separate uh, 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 you know spectrum however if we go beyond this uh, small commercial usage and if we want to go in as uh, now i mean consumer usage and go into commercial usage where we'll have to start uh, synchronizing with air traffic control of you know the train uh, regular aircraft because we might be interfering with those uh, you know safety requirements over there during that time there they have specific uh, spectrums already allocated for air traffic control and we will have to integrate it in those things before this uh, you were actually discussing about how drones can potentially be um, used in for instance in healthcare services essential services basically you know yes. to essentially behave like an enabler so mr ravi krishna murthy here has perhaps an add on to that uh, he wants to know about uh, the potential of uses of drones specifically for agricultural purposes like for spraying pesticides uh, or nutrients or even crop health analysis for carrying out crop health analysis and uh, before this discussion i remember uh, you saying that agriculture was one of those uh, areas which was to begin with uh, sort of relaxed even when drones were being banned uh, for 2014 so how do you essentially see that playing out right now so uh, in terms of the regulation and the framework if i have to say uh, as per the dgca regulation which has come out in uh, 2018 december it specifically says that payload delivery and how does it define payload delivery is nothing should separate from the uh, drone in flight and that is the definition of payload delivery so which means that you cannot do spring at all legally currently so that is how the uh, regulation is framed right now however there is a frequently asked questions that is attached to the regulation and in that they sent specifically for farmer use for pesticide and crop spraying it will be allowed that is in the faq and not in the uh, it's in the faq and the guidelines not in the uh, policy document okay. so that is one thing so that therefore it is a little questionable but it is allowed but there is an other governing body which disallows it again this is not okay. to do with dgca there is another mm-hmm. governing body uh, i am not sure about what is the name of the government body it is basically for 
it is an agency which controls pesticide spraying and other things general agricultural uh, use of uh, general agricultural use in which it very clearly says that aerial spraying on farms is not allowed which includes drones now and the justification that they may have which i presume i'm not entirely certain of it aerial spraying is not allowed in farms because aerial spraying is typically done from a higher altitude which basically means that when you are spraying happens it will go into uh, areas which is not the target area and which is undesirable and therefore they have restricted uh, spraying from aerial uh, drones itself so this is from the regulatory re legal perspective even if dgca has allowed uh, drone spraying in um, uh, in their guideline in their guidelines and the faq it is still restricted by the uh, i think it is uh, what ministry it is i'm not really sure it is the agriculture and farming ministry or something like that i, I have to check the actual uh, agency that this allows it kishor what you told is particularly interesting given that uh, as we were entering sort of the peak of this pandemic spreading in the country where almost everyone started every state started taking this essentially as a pandemic and started treating it essentially as one uh, is that we saw drones actually being deployed and sort of being used to spread disinfectants around particular areas within the state so now that you say that the only uh, <clears throat> sort of relaxation was to uh, spray disinfectants when farmers are using them so how essentially did that i mean when drones are being used to spray disinfectants over cities how does that not violate dgcs norms in that case from what you said in my understanding it violates okay but who is going to bell the cat okay shashank i have a question for you particularly uh, because uh, you've been involved you've worked with the up government's forest department so i want you i i want to understand so when a particular government body approaches you for a for a particular project uh, so what exactly is a their scope of work to begin with and do you see that sort of uh, with time and as the project carries on do you see that particular scope also widening uh, in its reach so that's my first part of the question the second is what exactly were you supposed to a capture and whatever footage you capture how did the data sharing happen how exactly it was ensured that what you captured became the government's property and you did not retain any bit of it and whatever the government took away from you how exactly was that data stored processed what were the safeguards i want to understand sure. how that particular process works so sure to please or to react to the project happening this particular one we did happen in 2017 it is a very short project only for about 3 uh, days uh, the scope of the project didn't widen at all and again to uh, clarify this was not a project and a tender for the government right because tenders take time uh, so in this case what was uh, the what was what the the mode of operation was that like a large ngo who knew the forest department well got in touch with us and said hey by the way the forest department wants to use drones for this operation uh, and we can cover your cost for it will you be willing to do it and we said yes sure we'll do it right so in a sense there's no financial transaction between the government who the government body who authorized the operation and wanted the operation and the drone operator in this context uh, and that's pretty normal from what i can make out right because again it's it's hard for for the government to do quick short term projects which are being paid for so even in the current time under the current pandemic it's unclear as to how much of the drone work being done is uh, volunteer drone work by drone operators who are doing it in the interest of getting further work in the future in the government so it's a way to do free work so they're validating their operating credentials with like the police department so that they can use them for letters of reference going forward how much of those work is paid and and again like I'm, i have absolutely no insight into what the funding mechanism is for example all the sub drone surveillance work happening for the pandemic right now across the country so there have been projects in delhi projects in ahmedabad uh, in telangana and that i know of which have definitely been well advertised uh, but again who's paying for it how it's being paid for is is unclear at this point of time um, going back to our project specifically which was again uh, before the regulations in the current form were implemented what the state department wanted is they wanted drones to be flown to actually find this uh, rogue tiger right so they wanted us to that was the scope of work which is that fly drones for this many hours a day in looking for a tiger under supervision of the forest department official in charge on the ground right in that case at one time it was the the pccf the principal chief conservator forest for the state because it was such a high profile project uh, and we So the drones were flown the live stream of the 
of the drone video was being shared with the forest officials on the ground who were there with us uh, they were using it to actually do command and control so that is interesting where they were looking at the footage from above and actually making things happen on the ground in accordance with that right so they were telling okay send send elephants that way because that area needs to be closed off put up a fence here because we can see that there is a gap where the tiger might run out of so that was being done using the drone footage uh, but the other more interesting is even back then because this was 3 years ago was that people weren't really uh, familiar with drones at that point of time so in one case we were on one, one particular day we were told to fly a drone over an area where they knew that there was no chance of finding a tiger because they wanted the local population who were streaming out looking at the operation to actually come and move away from the actual operation site so they we flew the drones so that people gathered around uh to actually look at the drone while the elephants and the forest guards conducted this sort of operation a few kilometers away right so it was used as a in a sense not as surveillance but as a distraction to make sure that the the work could happen unhindered right so again then they really expanded the scope of work because we were just going to fly a drone in aid of this tiger capture project and that's what we actually did um and all the footage we collected again it had people were captured in the footage but they were incidental captures because the main focus was the actual operation it, itself and all the footage captured was handed over to the forest department who at that point of time were very explicit about the fact that they didn't want this footage showing up on any tv channel or any media anywhere else at all right again there was so for this entire this entire project okay there's no there is no written paperwork actually saying go ahead and do the project right there's no financial tail linking the government to the drone operators in this context uh there is it's 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 all it, it's all completely in a sense deniable and uh, deniable and this is again a few years ago but uh, there's no way to actually track back and say okay who ordered what at what point of time because a lot of it as kishore mentioned is verbal is over the phone uh, is people who are meeting and then speaking to each other and again not for any reason of secrecy but just because that's the way things operate on the ground uh, so things are just being done in that particular banner and the case today is not very different even with the regulation in place things still operate the same way on the ground as well uh, which you're all familiar with and uh, that does need to change things need to be more formal to actually ensure accountability uh there's been a follow up question from mr ravi uh, who asked about the initial question about uh, the use of drones for agricultural purposes so mr ravi is asking if there is any chance that the no spraying regulation could potentially come under the ministry of chemicals and fertilizer Okay, uh, sure. I'm. I, that's for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, I'm just checking out the details of that. But as per, it is supposedly as per the Insecticide Act. Okay. According to the Insecticide Act, you cannot use uh, drones and unmanned machines and hazardous tools for spraying hazardous chemicals. I'm just trying to read through the details as we uh, speak. Okay. Uh, it is uh, Insecticides Act, 1968. aerial applica- aerial application of pesticides needs approval permission from the central insecticides board further no permission approval has been granted by the central insecticide board in the past for the use of the drones to spray pesticides so central insecticides board that's the governing body there okay uh, so we have a very interesting question here um uh it's from it's, it's from an anonymous attendee but the question is quite interesting uh so of course biometric data is under the dra- the current uh, personal data protection bill which is being uh, deliberated upon by a joint parliamentary committee uh classifies uh, biometric data under sensitive personal data and of course the the thing that that a drone records which includes your facial data your thermal data potentially all of them fall under biometrics and as a result under sensitive personal data so do you think uh, in that particular instance because it's dealing with something as serious as sensitive personal data and the data protection bill in its current form also emphasizes a lot of safeguards this particular category of uh, personal data do you think in protection it is that for me it's it's, it's open to both of you okay i'm not a uh, i don't understand the privacy i mean i'm not very familiar with the whole privacy argument okay. that go around so therefore i'm not a very good person to be talking in those lines however yes i do agree that uh, when we have seen this and uh, data privacy in the way the operations have been in the past it's always been a concern even for us also because at any time will this be brought back and labeled on us as, i mean I, as a business i have been more interested in safeguarding my own business 
at that at the time you know so it's like whenever i'm handing over data because of the problem you know when we handed over when we were doing data even for the national highways and other places you they were they were supposed to be in the original discussion you know you have like a secure login we are supposed to copy our data into those particular places and those kind of things were they talked about but when it actually comes to action or it is like it's a very casual hard disk uh, you take one hard disk somewhere he goes then i have to call him back and ask him so many times you have to give me back my hard disk i need to copy new data this kind of you know Uh, uh, and then he'll say, "I'm coming. I'll come one hour. I have got to. I have to go to this place. I have to go to." The, I mean, it's extremely casual. That's what I want to say. It's you not. Know, it's always been extremely casual in handling uh, of data. But uh, in kind, in terms of what kind of uh, concerns we should have, I think a person who is studying privacy should be a better uh, person to, you know, uh, argue about that. I mean, I would of course say that uh, anyone who's dealing with uh, use of drone uh, drones and the police in particular, given. Uh, the kind of abuse that's possible in their hands uh, of course drone should be held to extremely high safety standards and to extremely stringent protocols shashank would you want to answer yeah sure that's yeah. that's a really it's a really good question and yeah. uh, i would definitely answer that, like it, I, i don't know about higher standards but all of it should be held to a high standard right all biometric data uh, so even with like drone use there are practices people can follow on the ground so uh, one reference is uh, this group called we robotics which uh, is based out of switzerland uh, it's a large drones for good humanitarian action uh, non profit uh, set sets up uh, groups of uh, what they call flying labs across the world which are essentially consortiums of drones for uh, good users in various countries so in india for example we are part of the india flying lab which is one such group now we robotics is also one of the formulators for of the humanitarian uh, unmanned aerial vehicle operator network so the humanitarian uav network which essentially formulates guidelines for the use of uavs in humanitarian settings and part of their guidelines include uh, information on for drone operators on privacy which essentially is that if you're capturing footage try not to do any live streaming work like you can always record footage and then play it back later so don't do any live streaming work and also when capturing footage take it from top down not at an angle so that you don't capture people's faces in the footage because uh, that's almost never required from a humanitarian perspective right and those are good guidelines to follow even uh, in regular drone use as we go forward uh, so i would definitely say people interested more in this the humanity the ua huav network is a good resource uh, as is video robotics and india specifically the what media nama has been doing is fascinating so again those uh, rtis were really useful uh, after the delhi protests and the riots and uh, in terms of how the drones were being used uh, and also the internet freedom foundation has been doing some work around drones as well in india so uh that's another good resource to like look into for more information on privacy around drones uh you said interesting about uh, the shooting angles very particularly uh because uh, at least with the kerala story that we did uh the the police said that they've actually uh, and this story is uh, from last week from what i remember is that the police the police uh, said that in only that one small district they had arrested at least 170 people in within 3 days itself uh, people who were violating the lockdown so which clearly means that it was definitely not just a top down thing to perhaps scare away people into their homes sure. but the police was very actually and very actively looking for people who were violating it and they were actually hunting them down after that no there's lots of footage of exa- of, uh, of of anger shots we can see people's faces quite clearly um they being again like going back to the issue of abuse at the hands of the police right in terms of like how drones are being used there been cases again i seen footage from ahmedabad where drones are being used to film people on their rooftop so you have no idea whether they're part of one family but they're all living in one building obviously they're up on the roof enjoying the evening and then a drone flies overhead and captures footage of all of them right and they're on private property uh come again complete violation of the civil rights come and it's absolutely useless in the terms of enforcing a lockdown because what do you get out of chasing people on private property who are in the same building back indoors when they out on the roofs it's not like a virus like spreads by line of sight right it's uh, it's got it's, it's it's biological it's not it's not this like irrational uh if you look at someone you can get a virus right but that's the way they're acting uh and drones are totally being used to enforce this very perverse notion of uh, what a lockdown should look like uh kishore i had a question for you in particular um so this morning i did a story this was this was a small instance uh from a place called morbi city in gujarat where the police you, I mean, the video went quite viral i'm sorry you, were, you must be aware of it where two entrepreneurial gentlemen were actually using a drone 
and on the drone was tied two tobacco packets and they were essentially distributing it among themselves so the police arrested both of them on the charges of delivering a non essential commodity during the lockdown under section 188 so which wasn't allowed but when i asked them about why they did not also charge them on using a drone without any kind of a clearance the police in that police station told me that they did not even know what kind of a drone it was and what they should even start doing about it so you know with all the kind of relaxations and limitations within the digital sci policy that for instance a nano drone can be used for a particular purpose uh, a micro drone can be used for another particular purpose so do you think that on the ground when police people will actually be implementing this thing uh, there perhaps is not enough knowledge which again results in you know sort of the regulation not being implemented the way it is uh, expected to be yeah i think uh, there is a definitely a lack of information because i think uh, the police generally tend to look at it from the current situation of what they think is right and what they think is wrong so if they if in their own judgment that they think that the uh, cause is justified then you are let go of whatever you are crying you know so it is like uh, that way i think they take the, that independent discussion that tends to happen in uh, uh, the way it operates right now but yes i think uh, it is very difficult to tell uh, justify a good uh legitimate good use and uh, differentiated from uh, you know a bad use of a drone so i think uh, uh, that that complication is going to be there not now it's going to be there even in the future i think a lot of uh, in actual implementation of uh, distinguishing between a good use and a bad use over there in this particular case that you are telling me uh, i see there are different cases that can be actually be filed one is your for distribution of this thing but definitely i think there is a, another side of it which is to say that illegal flying of drone itself is a, you know case to book so i think they can definitely be charged whether whether it is in the big picture the right thing to do or not as per the law i think they can be charged for illegal flying also and uh, it, but then there is an also a problem you know it's like for example the crops spring drones when if dgca has given whether it how legitimate is a guideline or a faq be giving you permission to do a, a crop spring drone when the regulation does not allow it you know so i don't know the legitimacy of that but even if i take that as uh, the rule and say that okay you can do a farmer thing the same drones which were in under that category built for farming are today doing pest, uh, disinfectant spraying in the city it's an illegal use for i mean the reason that they were allowed to build that particular drone itself was for certain other cause and now it is not being used for that purpose so i think yeah there are a lot of good, there's going to be a lot of questioning that can happen around all of these uh, things i think it's only because it is enforced by a government agency that it's going to be taken lightly but otherwise i think uh, as per the, purely speaking by the rule book it's it's illegal in all ways Shashank, would you want to weigh into that? Yeah, I completely agree with Kishore. Like the thing is, you can easily prosecute two uh, people trading tobacco using a drone, but then you should be prosecuting everybody, right? Because the idea is that if you have laws which are so vague as to be selectively applied, then they're then they're unjust because you cannot just pick and choose when you can apply a law because that's not the way laws are supposed to work. Uh, they don't work one way for some people and a different way for other people. So if you're going to prosecute anyone on illegal thing, they should. everyone who's doing illegal flying which is everyone flying a civilian drone in india at this point of time should be prosecuted including the police exactly okay yes. okay uh, okay i think i have i have one potentially big question about the silence of the dgca in how the policy has been sort of implemented or the lack of the implementation of the policy and how the dgca has been absolutely silent um how it has also in many instances been singled out and almost left out where its acknowledgement has not even been felt necessary uh, so do you think that perhaps the entire policy in itself needs a relooking uh, and to begin with the provisions might potentially be difficult to enforce and do you think all of that needs restructuring and reworking again just to just to ensure that the policy at the ground level is in at least implementable and the dgc are going to at least be kept in the know how of how it's being used on the ground my personal opinion is that if you try to make a framework which is going to be covering every aspect of potential use and misuse it's going to be so exhaustive that nobody is actually going to follow it i think it should be incremental you bring in the you make a, a rule which is rather very simplistic to begin with and you keep amending it or improving it based on the actual uh, use case 
you know how people are misusing it uh, over time so then you bring in a particular extra clause or whatever you need to do to actually curb that particular use but i think trying to have an overarching entire spectrum covering uh, regulation right from the start is not going to work and that's exactly how i think even fa started doing it because they had initially a fairly simplistic and they kept uh, amending those uh, rules and regulations based on the actual ground scenario how people are using and misusing it based on that they would actually keep amending it if you look at our regulation there has only been one that has come out and it's tried to be over and in uh, covering the entire trying at least uh, with the intent to cover the entire spectrum and it's not been effective at uh, uh, from a to z for anything you know in the end yeah so it is not helped in any way that way well to be fair there were also talks of a drone policy 2.0 as soon as the first policy itself came out i think within a month or two but of course that hasn't materialized so shank you were saying something they did they yeah. did come up with a uh, they did come up with a Uh, i think at the aerospace convention some uh, i forgot the uh, event the stage event that happened in january of 2019 uh, last year so that is when it was announced that bvlos 2.0 will be out and the draft is already ready all of those things came out over there and then it silent since then yeah shashank you think so i do i do think that over here at least on the ground what's interesting is that the moment there was a crisis and emergency where the different states felt that they had to do something about it the policy just went out of the window right and again like you're saying it's been happening for a while as well but it's far more visible now in the past few weeks because just because the states are now have a very explicit reason which is that oh we need drones really badly and the regulations are actually in the way which is a very strong indicator that something needs to change drastically right and one way to for again to look at it is the fact that the civil the ministry of civil aviation and the dgca are responsible for like air safety among other things so one way to partition it is to you know for example make the safety part of drones come under the dgc and the regulations only apply for safety around drones so flight drones for example telling the nearest like air force base or telling other aircraft operators in the area so that there's no like untoward incident in the air itself but actual operations happen with the consent of the you know local administration because we've had again very good experiences working directly with district collectors and district magistrates because they know what's needed on the ground they understand their uh, jurisdiction very well they're able to actually say okay fine this operation is going to help like civil society at large so we'll permit the operation right and again they have local information on this and that definitely one way to actually take things forward uh, because at this point of time the current scenario is not working for anyone uh, so uh, this is uh, okay sure saying something oh shrinivas you want to you want to weigh in something so i want to ask one yeah. question uh so we had couple of drone instances in the uk i believe which resulted in airport lockdowns i think it was glasgow airport maybe uh where uh, uh, uk now, uk yeah in uh, uk that gatwick. gatwick okay yeah. yeah the gatwick incident so where we had someone claiming they spotted a drone and the entire airport like shuts down all the flights are halted then you, then the cops essentially send in choppers to find this drone so anybody who sees a chopper thinks it's actually a drone in the night uh, i think it was a pilot actually who was trying to take off who reports the air, air traffic controller that he has seen an unidentified object he doesn't know if it's a drone he doesn't know what it is so now which brings this question uh, to let's bring this question to dgca will the dgca only wake up when it comes to the safety question of airports and a drone sp- being spotted at a airport Uh, what does it take to actually bring safety into the picture uh, uh, regulating drones in the right way so that we avoid this i mean it could be a hobby thing it could be actually someone miscreant who's probably doing this but the concerns do remain and dgca actually takes its counter uh, civil aviation authority uh, authority seriously because during the consultations they were actually receiving lot of inputs from its uh, their brother and sister organizations who would tell them what they should be doing so will the indian experience matter to others or will uh, it's a larger policy question that i have. there was actually a particular i mean you uh, quoted uh, uh, the uk uh, uh, thing that happened event that happened but a similar thing also happened in india and it was not uh, reported so widely and not so seriously taken but i think the warning signals went out even during in in, uh, in india itself also 
so yes i think there are uh, there is a, a good case for it in fact i think that there are uh, this is a, this is the reason why anti drone technology is a, a area that i think is of very high importance and in it is my understanding that the real drone regulation which is as of now just a you know i wash is real drone regulation is actually going to take off when they have anti drone technology so that will be the key to actually getting a full fledged drone effective drone regulation in india that is that is my understanding and anti drone technology is as of now best understood in three formats one is completely uh, shoot down a drone which you think is illegal that's one method to do it then the second method is where in you actually take control of the drone and bring it land it down to safety and the third method is where you completely jam the communication and assume that in the jam communication it is uh, you know taken care of the drone is taken care of you know sort of like that so i uh, effective anti drone technology is i think the key to getting a very good drone policy so shank do you have a comment on not this not particular that, question that's fine should really cover that well okay okay so i think uh, i think it was a pretty fascinating discussion especially for me because i've been uh, uh a I, i have also been very limited in the way that i've been looking at drones especially with how the police uses it but of course there is an entire gamut on how potentially drones can be enablers but also raise significant privacy and surveillance concerns um so what we're essentially uh, seeing uh, play out in india is, uh, at least in the last uh, last year is that drones have essentially uh, been a tool of state surveillance uh, they've helped the police uh, almost every time that they wanted it to uh, the police has been absolutely whimsical in the way that they've been deploying drones um there's never written order like i have regurgitated at least n number of times by now which of course uh, raises questions around accountability and transparency in the entire process uh, then there are concerns about how, what the drone policy in itself can do if it can in itself be an enabler if it helps indian manufacturers if it helps them in the competition uh, from certain chinese manufacturers also from the us especially for defense and commercial drones uh, I, what my sense essentially is from here is that uh, drones will and are uh, becoming uh, tools that we'll perhaps see more and more especially after the lockdown ends uh, i do hope that people who use drones do not end up abusing them and they keep in mind that people do people roaming around in the streets should not be viewed as essentially criminals and they have to prove otherwise drones should not uh, hamper people's civil liberties people are people and um, yeah uh, so i think it was a pretty great discussion uh, we talked about the policies and if the policies need reworking and how the dgc has been silent so the dgc the dgc perhaps should look at the discussion and potentially wake up to the occasion uh so the attendees we will see a feedback uh, form at the end of the discussion i would urge them to use the form and leave their feedback about the discussion uh, also mention things that we should consider perhaps for this for, for discussions from here uh, i would also urge all of you to please uh, to please join friends.haski.com uh, that way we can uh, you can we can uh, keep updating you about discussions and we can keep chatting about uh, what we are about to do next Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope to see all of you very soon. Thank you, Samia. Thanks, Kishor. Thank you, Sushant. Thank, Thank you, Samia. Thank you. Thank you. See you. See you.